What is up, guys, and welcome back to the Sweat It Out podcast. Today, we have a very, very special guest. He is the founder and chief test pilot of Gravity Industries. He's a tremendous entrepreneur. I'm telling you, this guy's an innovator, and he's the real-life Iron Man. Please help me welcome the one and only Richard Browning. How's it going? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good indeed. You got a you got an epic setup back there, man. It's uh, it's inspiring to see all of, all of the the gear you got back there. It's incredible. Yeah, it's a little bit of our back cave here, uh, but it's all functional. That those are actually jet suits sitting there. Just you know, we thought we might as well make the storage area look kind of funky. So uh, yeah, we I can't deny I've done quite a few uh, interviews and podcasts and stuff with that background. It's uh, it's an easy win. Awesome. So I, I definitely got to ask you right off the bat because right now I feel like I'm been watching an Iron Man movie. So which one's the prototype and which is the next steps from those suits back there? They're all different. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so, uh, and I have to look because if I try and point, I always point the wrong <laughs> way. So, um, so actually the funky middle one there um, is fairly old. Um, the, the, the fuel tank covers are 3D printed, uh, but the middle section where the rear engine is, is a lot of aluminum work from the old days. Uh, the, the, the helmet up there is actually the helmet that we did the wingsuit testing with. There's a film on YouTube that's done like nearly 19 wow. million views. Uh, from that helmet um, uh, and then on the other side so you're seeing the, the actually more useful seeing the suit over there that's actually the back of the suit where uh, over there where um, yeah there we go for point better there we go that is actually the side you'd clamp to your back that's the that's where that's ready to put on Super the one cool. in the middle there is looking the other way um, that's entirely 3d printed in, in polymer um, and quite high tech that's the one we use to train clients with and then the other side, the kind of evil looking one, ah, it's not turned around the right way though. Um, we've just been testing that one, that's why. Um, the, the far one there is all entirely 3D printed as one kind of, one monocoque kind of piece. That's quite high tech, but what I really would like to show you, but I can't yet, is the brand new version. It's what we're calling it the sort of third generation suit. Those are second generation, the third generation one, we were flying it this afternoon. It is epic. It starts like in 10 seconds compared to these things uh, take more like uh, 45 seconds. In fact, and this is like hot off the press, literally only an hour ago, we did a fun test where I stood there with no harness on or anything like that. Uh, the suit was sitting there and I managed to put the suit on with no clipping in or anything that was complicated. Oh my and God. I was hovering in front of the guy with a camera in 45 seconds. So that's that was incredible. Pretty insane. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's getting quite cool now. <laughs> what, what inspired you to go down this path and start, you know, building these in incredible, you know, pieces of equipment? Yeah, so um, uh, there's a few ingredients to this kind of mix. Uh, the first one was that uh, my whole family background was from the world of aviation and engineering. My late father was a maverick inventor and designer and engineer, and I grew up kind of building and making things with him in his workshop. Um, his father was a pilot. My other grandfather, Sir Basil Blackwell, used to run um, the UK's main helicopter manufacturer, you know, like a sort of baby, baby Lockheed Martin type of thing. Mm. So. Um, I went off though to join um, an oil company. I was an oil trader for 16 years, but in parallel, uh, six years in the British Royal Marines Reserve as well. If you put all of that into a pot and give it a big stir, then I suppose I'm somebody who loves a crazy challenge. I love looking at something when especially people say that can't be done or I can't do it or that can't be possible. And obviously there needs to be a purpose, you know, I have to get quite inspired by the potential outcome. But um, there was a lot, of that, a lot of that going on, but also the Royal Marines taught me a lot about kind of human capability. When you really think about human beings, the human is a machine, it can do so many different things. I mean, we can purpose, repurpose ourselves to do just a ridiculous number of things. And I used to think from my training days, how crazy that I can, I, I've managed to train myself to sort of hold my body weight in various gymnastic kind of positions. And I thought, well, if I just swap out what I'm leaning on for some momentary support of, a, of an engine of some kind, then actually I should be able to kind of rise up off the ground. And then I reckon the brain is good enough at balance, you know, think of snowboarding and skiing and frankly, even walking. I thought you could repurpose your brain to kind of learn that balance. And I just thought it'd be really cool if it worked. And there was no business reason at all. And I did it all in my evenings and weekends and um, back in 2016, got it to work. It was just a crazy challenge, frankly. So I love how you mentioned in there, how you had that training background, you know, as, uh, as you know, we're, we're both come from the training world. So how big of an impact did that training background help you with what you're doing today? So uh, in my lunch breaks um, from, you know, my city trading job, I'd go and try and forget about all the challenges and go and in a kind of pretty amateur way, I got really into calisthenics, you know, like street kind of um, urban gymnastic type stuff. 
Um, so flags, muscle ups, handstand dips, all that kind of stuff, mainly because I'm relatively light, pretty strong for my weight. And I just kind of thought it's really cool to try and use rather than weights, try and use your own body weight for this stuff. Um, and actually the journey of about five years of just gradually, you know, how slow those kind of the progress is, I got reasonably good. And I, and I started to think that, well, that's, that gave me the confidence to think that if I can support my weight in a planche, I could just about do a reasonable planche. Then that's a ludicrously uh, challenging position to try and hold, right? Structurally, that's terrible. Oh, it's insane. All, yeah. All the strain going through your shoulders. If you never saw somebody do it, you'd think you'd never be able to do it. But you know, you know what training's like. You put your mind to it, and five years later, <laughs> you can just about <laughs> get there. And it's amazing how your brain and your body adapt to gradually keep up with what you're trying to d- get it to do. So genuinely, a huge part of the rationale, the, the logic behind what I was trying to do, was motivated by that learning journey with calis- calisthenics. You know, about about trying to repurpose that that strength and balance. How difficult was it uh, when you, you know, first put on the suit to really or reorient yourself and, and find that balance? Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of bad example to answer that question in some ways, because <laughs> I mean, if you see, see the footage, like the, the, if you look for Richard Browning TED Talk, for instance, or in our Gravity Industries YouTube, you can see the really crappy phone footage of how we developed this. And it was genuinely me trying with one engine on one arm, and then I try another engine on the other arm and jump around and realize, oh, shit, I'm way a bit less. Uh, what if I double that? You know, where, where else can I attach this thrust in a way that's intuitively balanceable? So I learned incrementally as I played with the technology. So there was definitely not a day where I sort of built it and then strapped it on and then tried to fly. I had the luxury of learning in incremental stages, but also no luxury of knowing it was even possible or having any sort of support or tether or safety systems. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I, I was never in danger of keeping going up. You could always manage that, but certainly falling over, I fell over 30 times easily, wow. you know, but. I mean, but, but only from like four or five feet or so most of the time. It's just kind of embarrassing. Only, and, only four or five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, you know, I used to cycle commute across London and I think I hurt myself more doing that than I did learning to do this. But still took a lot of respect. But what's really fun now, though, we've trained over 90 clients and like seven of my team fly. Um, and actually watching them and all those clients learn, it's fascinating because we've now refined it so much that it's really nothing of the burden that it was when I first started this. When I first started, actually, that calisthenics is really useful you know, where you've got strength in a range of motions rather than just banging out dumbbell curls yep. where a slight deviation from that and you might rip something because you're, you're out of balance. Oh, you're Rolling making us up. so happy with all yeah, this. Big time. Yeah, yeah big we big love this. <laughs> you, you know, you know, like the, the, the very act of rolling from a crunchy kind of position up into a handstand, what your shoulders having to do there to stably roll all of that top heavy weight up means you've got a whole load of balance and strength in a range of areas. So kind of accidentally meant that when I was goofing around with all this horsepower trying to work out how to fly um, I had a lot of tolerance to get it wrong without ripping something pulling something I don't think I ever did really but the first system that flew had an engine on the back of each leg and two on each arm and that was so difficult to fly like like it was like rubbing your tummy and patting your head kind of thing it was (laughs) really complicated whereas now as ridiculous as it sounds I can get most people to learn to fly one of these in a morning Uh, really one day yeah Oh, right, so, by so the end me of- and Josh, we're gonna book a flight over there. Yeah, we were just talking. We're like, we gotta, we gotta find. We're gonna, gonna, go we we're, gonna we're gonna take a a, a lesson with you. <laughs> so we so we do it we do it in the UK. Um, before COVID, we used to do it in LA as well, quite a lot. Um, there's an okay. air base there we used to use a lot, and you simply just get clipped in like you've got a, a rock climbing top rope, and you put it on low power, and you realize as you squeeze the trigger, there's just this gentle push, and as you then just go and lean forward on this thrust, you just feel like you're leaning on a magic invisible surface. And as you bring your arms in, you gradually realize that it just pushes you up a bit. And as you flare your arms out, you come down again. And pretty much everything else is as intuitive as everyday life. If I fall this way, what do I do? I put my hand out. Well, now I've got some magic thrust coming out of it, which pushes me back without having to find a surface. So your brain just like wires within minutes sometimes. Um, so most people, especially if they've got a little bit of sporty, balancey kind of ability they learn it yeah within a morning not a day but a morning and i mean by the end of the first day we've had some people even coming off the tether they've got so good and just moaching around a few feet off the ground well richard i'm gonna tell you you have a fascinating product right there and i, I wanted to ask you because i'm curious because you know like in everything you always see people trying to copy or people get ideas from other things and you know there's always similar things out there what what is it that separates your product apart and makes it so unique amongst all the the other people that are trying to do similar things out there realm of kind of i don't know how you define it even really but you know small novel ways of human beings flying and i should just say as well 
part of the ethos, the, the, the starting point was rather than sitting inside a flight vehicle or have a seat and a stick or a yoke, um, probably a computer to do most of it. The whole idea here was start with a human being, use the brain as the flight computer and the body as the flight structure and see what is the minimal next bit you need to add. It's just the horsepower, that's it. And then your body does everything else. Those suits there do absolutely nothing without adding a human. It's a bit like a bicycle in a way, but it's not a very sexy analogy. Um, <laughs> so so if, you, if, you, if you cluster the other examples of a similar kind of ethos, so you've got Frankie the French guy with the hoverboard, you've got uh, David Maiman in California with a, a traditional kind of jetpack thing. Um, you've got Eves Rossi and the guys in Dubai, although it's unfortunately one of those guys died recently oh, wow. with the um, fixed wing. Do you remember seeing all the footage online of flying alongside like a big a uh, airliner with a big carbon fiber wing? Yeah. The guy yeah. strapped under it, very famous mm. footage. Uh, I know the founder of that, Yves Rossi, a brilliant Swiss guy. Um, Dubai kind of took on the idea, and it's really tragic that one of those wingsuit guys has died doing it. But um, their ethos, I mean, they, they're, they're very high altitude. They're really high. They're relying on parachutes. It's a very different world from us. But really, it's just us, the French guy and the Californian guy. He's actually Australian, but he lives in California. It's only really those three, you know, the three of us that are doing this. Um, and they've all got their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, Frankie got on a hoverboard, for instance. It's a similar kind of engines, but he's standing on them. Um, he goes very high and very fast, higher than I'd wish to go, I think. Um, but his big challenge is he can't take off or land on anything other than a raised platform because the engines are under him and he just digs a big hole in the ground if he goes near them. You know, it's a bit like mm -hmm. when I had engines on the back of my legs. And then David with his, he, David's jetpack system, I think the challenge he's got is it's just such a great big lump and it's quite immobile in a lot of ways. It just doesn't seem to have captured people's imagination. Undeniably, part of our success is down to the fact that when people see this, they go, Oh, it looks like Iron Man. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my starting point, but it's quite flattering to have people draw that parallel because that's an amazing, I know, you know, artificial creation, but it's an amazing demonstration of the dream that most people have of human flight. Um, so I think we've got closest to that. I think we've got closest to something that you really can just pack in two suitcases and turn up any other world usually and go flying anywhere. Um, it's truly amazing. So I, I, I think, I wasn't really inspired by those guys, let's say, because I, I did this sort of, par in, you know, in parallel. Um, but yeah, I, there, there's only a small collection of people. This was genuinely very different from anything anybody thought was probably really that possible, I think. Can you, can you buy these like commercially? Or is that something that you're thinking about doing in the future? I mean, I don't know what kind of regulations there are around flying those things, but. Um, generally, we don't sell them that much. We, we have sold a couple, but in both cases, we insisted on training the pilots first and even then a bit like that ridiculously expensive ferrari ffx or fxx whichever it is um when you buy that from ferrari they don't let you take it home it's mm -hmm. so extreme that they keep it and they help you get it set up and they nurture you around a track and let's have loads of fun and then you go home and they keep it so in the same way not because this is really difficult to look after or really difficult to fly it's just from a reputation point of view you know there was a load of reports it's happened twice now. There's been reports of somebody flying some kind of jetpack in near LAX. Mm -hmm. You know, I can put my hand on my heart and say it's absolutely nothing to do with us because I know where every single one of my suits are. If I'd sold a load and let them go, I'm not sure I can necessarily do that. So we've made really good money out of doing events and training clients and doing lots of military and search and rescue work. And we don't need to take the risk of having these go just out the door like any sort of sale product. But like I say, we do commission them for certain people when they prove they are sensible flying them with us. Are the military interested in that? Have they like talked to you at all about, you know, maybe contracting you guys to, to do stuff uh, with them or produce, you know, jetpacks for them as well? Because you, you did mention, you know, you guys do yeah. search and rescue, which is incredible, by the way. Yeah, I can talk more about that in a minute, if you like. The, the military, because yeah, sure. of, of the Royal Marines background, we had a bit of an unfair advantage. And it started out as a, look, let's just come along. And if nothing else, kind of blow people's minds a little bit with like what a crazy idea can lead to as a sort of, inspiration sort of thing but actually i kind of secretly knew that we had probably something that was pretty epic from a special forces mobility ingress at exfil perspective but you know you've got to prove these things rather than just sort of guess and so we've now done nearly 15 different military exercises around the world with the us uk and other allied forces and a bit like that paramedic film we've surprised ourselves with what we can do i mean to, to paint a bit of a picture you can take off with this latest system you can take off from cold in 10 seconds you can travel a couple of miles in a couple of minutes. You can land on something the size of a palm of your hand. You can leave the engines idling on your hips, immediately liberate your hands, perform a task, 
And then while, cause they're still running, you can then just re kind of pick up the arms again and take off and either move around the target or exfil by yourself. There's no dependence on a helicopter. You're not climbing back up a rope <laughs> or anything like that, or wishing you hadn't got dropped off. Um, your extreme special forces personnel mo mobility is kind of crazy with this system. Um, so it, it, as with any new technology, it's a kind of long pathway to probably get established in that area, but we've proven ourselves quite strongly in a lot of fields and we've got a lot of collaborations ongoing, which is really fun. I want to say that off the bat, you know, it's such a mobile device that you can literally, like you were saying, like you don't have to take something in big, like a helicopter or a plane or, you know, have so, some kind of machine to, to extract somebody, you know, out of a, of a certain spot that might be um, too small for something like that to land. And you send in one of these with somebody and they can literally perform the task like this quickly, faster and safer. So it's really amazing to, to see the, the, the different ways that you can use this in, in so many positive ways. You know, there was no, there was no, you know, most people build a business because they've got an idea and they think there's a market and they follow that normal pathway. I genuinely set this up with no business idea at all. I thought it'd be cool and I didn't know it was possible and I did it alongside that day job and then it just worked so well and it just had this really crazy effect on people. I mean, you guys have obviously seen it online. Lots of people listening have probably seen it online, but you know, I can speak from experience of delivering 108 events in 31 countries with the team before COVID struck. Every single time you see this live, um, people just lose their minds. I've had people literally in kind of tears in, the, the, in how profound, and I can't really explain why, but it's like people have inside them an innate passion and desire to fly. I think a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. kids, I think, it's, I think it's technically reported as the most common positive dream that every, every human beings have, which is the idea of flying. It's something we can never do to break free of gravity and move like the birds. It's something we always kind of dream of. Um, and I think for a lot of people that see this, this brings that dream to life. Um, and because it's so small, it's definitely a human with a little bit of equipment and the human's flying and that in their brain just does something magic. So that's why, you know, one of our main focuses, certainly before COVID was to build a race series out of it. We're still going to do it. It's just been a bit slower. Um, and I think that is a way of scaling that magic to a bigger audience. Um, but yeah, uh, the, 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 the kind of that impact, I think of, allowing a bunch of specialists to all approach a target independently when you really think about it hovering a helicopter over a deck of a ship is quite a vulnerable thing you know anybody with even small arms can make a really bad day for the people in the helicopter you lose the helicopter the entire team and the pilot and the crew whatever whereas we can just come low over the water from every direction you don't really it's very loud but you don't hear it until the last second and then you're up over the side and landed uh, we've done that quite a few times and it, it's been great to see the impact on the people watching. Well, truly phenomenal. And, and I want to point out, the, I really loved how you mentioned about, you know, as, as people and, and especially kids, like envisioning the dream of flying one day. Like I know we've talked about, we were talking about before we, when you went to get your beer, we we're like, Hey man, we got to get our flying license. Ooh, we would love to. Yeah. Fly, yeah we're like, do fly. we, how, do you, you need, know? we're like, do you need a pilot's license? Like if so, like, should <laughs> we me, also get an airplane? <laughs> okay so you'll you'll like the, so let me answer the whole thing about do you need a license and stuff so this is this is another this is another good reason why just selling these to loads of people would be an, a bit of a challenge because we haven't done that and because half of my team and most of my team are in their 20s i mean i'm 41 but um the other half of my team are all veteran like fast jet pilots and helicopter pilots from the military so they are you know they, they to their cost know a lot about regulation and safety and processes so we build in behind the scenes a huge amount of self-regulation to keep it as safe as we can as a result the caa in the uk and the faa in the us um to give them full credit we you know they looked at us after a sort of year or so of doing all these events around the world we never flew, flew very high we never got in the way of other aircraft we never flew over other people or property the only risk was to the pilot and that was managed by never flying very high um because they acknowledged that we'd done that they very graciously in both jurisdictions said actually carry on doing what you're doing there is no need to invent a rule set to come and squash you wow. um think think about what happened with drones you know they, anybody could do anything with a drone until suddenly a half a dozen people around the world got them in the way of aircraft and stuff and then suddenly the rules came in and spoiled everybody's mm -hmm. day um because we keep control of this and we are sensible actually strictly speaking and you'll never get the faa on record to say this but the caa I don't know about on record, but they've said this directly to me. There is no rule that says you can't do this. This doesn't qualify as an aircraft. It's, it's too light to be an aircraft and it doesn't have a fixed or rotary wing. Therefore, it doesn't qualify as an aircraft and it doesn't also qualify as a drone. Now, having said all that, the authorities can quite happily step in overnight and say, right, we, I don't care what the rules say, you're just banned. 
they've never come anywhere near saying that because we've been sensible with it. So mm. it, it, it's, it's been a re, you know, really lucky break to find some lovely people in those organizations that have said, you know what, this is really cool and new and quite inspiring, especially for young people. Carry on being sensible and you know, go ahead. So to answer your question, there aren't really any rules, wow, <laughs> but, we, but we, govern it to make, yeah. Yeah. We, we govern it to make sure that we, there, there isn't the right. need for any extra rules beyond what we say. Right. Now you said like you don't really go that high or or fly over or anything, but I can assume that you yourself have kind of pushed the limits on what this thing can do. You know, can you kind of touch upon like what are the capabilities of, of the the equipment? Saying that a lot of people um, who would get a C grade in their physics for this think that it, it pushes off the ground somehow because they see a lot of footage and think we're just flying quite low and stuff. It doesn't push off the ground at all, but that just wouldn't work. Um, there's no ground effect. We're not compressing a la layer of air underneath us. If we had a big wing, then maybe, but no, actually it gets easier when you go higher because you don't get the recirculation of the hot air, which actually reduces the thrust a bit. Um, we tend to go 20, 30 feet over water, maybe 40, I've been about 120 over water. Wow. Uh, when, I was test when I was testing wings and you pull up and suddenly climb like crazy, and you look down and think that's going to really hurt if, it, <laughs> if, I have a, if I have a failure now. So um, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet or so over water, you know, over grass and, you know, shrubbery, woodland stuff, whatever, then, you know, you can still go about 20 feet or so. And, you know, I've fallen from that height and it's, it's okay. It's not a fun day out. But when you're over tarmac and concrete, you know, hard standing, for moments I've gone high and stuff, but you just got to look at it and think if I spend a lot of time constantly really high, all it's going to take is some unforeseen problem and it's impossible to eliminate all failures. Uh, you know, and I can break my legs and whatever. None of us have broken anything. None of us have had any, any significant irreparable accidents. And it's because of that ethos. Um, and actually we've really learned that from a entertainment uh, sort of tactical perspective and a search and rescue, there's actually no reason to go high. It's a natural mm. human instinct to say, Oh, how high can I go? But you don't entertain anybody by becoming a little black dot in the sky. They want to see your eyes <laughs> yeah. whizzing yeah. past. So yeah. I actually, want to see Iron just... Man. <laughs> yeah. well, there you go. Yeah, we, we've done some events when we've been further away and higher. People have gone like, I wish you'd come closer. Whereas we can literally hover almost as close as I am to the camera right in front of people. And that has real impact. So, you know, and then people have asked about parachutes and stuff. And yes, you can have parachutes. The problem is you need to go quite high for the parachute to stand a chance of working. And what happens if you get a failure where you rotate and it wraps you up in the parachute? Mm -hmm. You only learn that once and you're dead. So yeah. I like the ethos of making, making failure recoverable. All of our learning, you know, all of our failures have been, you know, get back up again and feel a bit sorry for yourself and learn and move on again. No, so, yeah, we just haven't. It's yeah. obviously you guys got everything down pat. This is, it's, it's so cool just to even hear um, everything you're saying and mentioning and the fact, especially with the rules, like obviously, you know, also as well, you guys respect everything that's going on. And I'm sure that's a big reason why you guys are having so much success. I want to ask you with with the the, the different um, the different types of, of suits that you have, is it gonna just stay there? You guys are always upgrading, upgrading, upgrading. See how you can make it better. You got? Do you have an endpoint for that, or is it just let's see how we can make this better every single time? If you ask a uh, you know an entrepreneur, an innovator, a business owner, what you know, when are you done? You're probably going to be quite <laughs> yeah, disappointed never. with the, you know <laughs> you know when when are you guys done with training never. or with what you know with your podcast, right? You know you don't. It, it's quite hard to get to that sort of finish point. You, 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 human nature is annoying, right? Anybody that's driven to achieve stuff, usually they get to the top of the mountain and think that was an amazing journey. Now I'm here. I can see a higher mountain. I'm going to go go that one. <laughs> that's it's right. really annoying. And me mental health wise, it's probably a shit strategy. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, it won't come as too much of a surprise that, you know, that system I'm pointing at right over the other side of my, I can't show it to you yet. That'll be the next we'll one. We'll, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we're going to do a sort of reveal in Q1 at some point. Um, it is just insane. It's so, I'm so excited about it because I, I, I could forgive people for thinking, you know, we've had a lucky break. We sort of stumbled over this technology and we've enjoyed all this social media and all these events. We're kind of done now. One trick pony kind of thing. Actually, no, we've opened the door onto a whole kind of mad world of stuff that people didn't think was possible. That system is getting pretty close. And again, I did, I did say, I'm not trying to build an Ironman suit, but it is getting pretty close <laughs> to that idea where I can talk to you now and just go bang, take off, fly around, land again and carry on talking to you. Give me 10 seconds and that achieves that. I mean, it's just insane. So once we've achieved that, we've already got some ideas how we can halve that time down to five seconds. So Unreal. yeah, we, we, we're not done. I mean, there's some various limits to sort of, you know, physics and thermodynamics, which mean you can't make those engines ever smaller and more powerful and stuff. So are you, but, are I mean, you guys it, considering it, doing a full suit at some point or no? Uh, well, yeah, you could do, I mean, you could do, um, 
uh, there is a thing. So Adam Savage, you know, from Mythbusters, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a thing online. It's on our, I mean, if you, uh, I'll plug our social media, take on gravity on Instagram and stuff. Um, and then uh, gravity industries on YouTube. You can see a film. Um, it, it was called Savage build. It was a sort of Adam Savage remake of um, Mythbusters. Um, he actually commissioned a full titanium Iron Man suit um, that was ballistically capable. And I flew it, um, which was bonkers because you couldn't see out of it and you could hardly move your arms and whatever. <laughs> oh, uh, but I mean, you could with how lightweight Kevlar ballistic protection is getting, you could build something that wouldn't look dissimilar that probably it'd be a pretty cool test. You could probably just hover and get shot at and probably be okay. But I mean, I'm not sure I'm That's volunteering insane. for that quite yet. Um, so yeah, you could probably do that. Um, so yeah, in a way you can nudge towards all the things in the film that in fact, I don't know if you guys know this. So there, there was a, the, the U S military sat down after the first Iron Man film came out and kind of went, I would love to have been in this meeting and actually went, look, it's a bit embarrassing, but that film does represent some quite cool stuff mm -hmm. out of the list of things that character can do. What's achievable? And they went through it like heads up display, situational awareness, comms, um, body armor, exoskeletons to lift weight. The one item on the list I'm told that they scrubbed off was the flight one because they all said that was going to be impossible. Very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but all the other things they've worked on. So it is technically possible. But the problem with a, you know, a, a, with a battlefield situation is everything just goes to crap and mm -hmm. you, you know, anything too high tech runs out of battery and breaks and whatever. So they're always quite skeptical of getting too high tech. But um, yeah, actually, if you really wanted to, you could produce nearly all of what you see in that film now, I think. So do you think that one day there is a possibility, I guess, when we have better resources or, you know, in the future where you can build something as close to the Iron Man suit with those, that AI technology built in with the technologies around it, doing all the stuff that it does? Do you think it's really possible one day? The biggest thing that occurs to me that is not possible yet is the form of propulsion that you see in the film the magic kind of hockey puck in his hand. <laughs> if somebody can tell me where to find that on Amazon, I'd like <laughs> several. Um, cause well, not only that, but like, it's also like a ballistic thing, right? Like he also well, uses we those do like that. weapons. We, no, we, we can do that. So if that's, oh, yeah? if that's producing thrust, it's supposed to be throwing something out, right? If you hold okay. a big, you so know, like big heavy medic. Yeah, if you hold a medicine ball and throw it away from you, you go the other way, right? And that's all the jet engines are doing, but they're just throwing air if that thing is like some sort of crazy ion thruster that's throwing something away, you go the other way. Okay. Um, we've kind of done that. So you can, you can, I've blown an oil barrel across a room. You can get oh. it on our social media what? where, but you sort of cheat because, because guess what? If you've got enough force to blow an oil drum that way with this arm, guess where you're going that way. <laughs> so you have to hold the, you hold the other arm the other way. It's not very Iron Man, but you hold the other iron arm that way that arm that way and then just waft the power at the oil drum and it will just blow it away wow. um so you can sort of do bits of it but it's it's the small form factor that's the crazy thing how can you how does how does that work i mean if you, know, you sort of saw your arms off and embed a jet engine where your arm was <laughs> that would probably work yeah. um that's the biggest hurdle i'd say um i mean a new frontier that we'll eventually get to is an electric system and i always say this because it sits in the back of my kind of view here that is actually the arm from our prototype electric version which is very similar they're electric ducted fans the biggest problem is that the batteries weigh too much mm -hmm. so you know as you know from teslas and stuff they all weigh yeah. like two tons because to get i mean let's use it let's use a fun example if that was jet fuel diesel or gasoline to get that amount of energy in batteries is 40 to 50 times the weight of Jeez. this so when you're flying that's a disaster you just can't get it off the ground very easily so as the science of that gets better we're ready to make an electric version that maybe gets closer to that that's amazing. I mean, you were saying that you were able to cover a couple of miles in, in a few minutes. How fast, you know, or, or what's, a, what's a relative speed that you like people to go at? And, you know, do, is, there, is there enough thrust to, to, like, eventually carry someone? Is that something that you want to be able to do, like, with search and rescue with, you know, military operations? Other kind of uh, capability and stuff. Um, so we set uh, our new Guinness World Record um, in November, I think it was last year, 85 miles an hour, um, which is pretty quick. What? Um, what? It, it, yeah, what? Yeah, that's on, that's on the YouTube thing as well. So um, that was actually using a bit of a leg wing, so a bit like a wingsuit wing. If you sort of spread your legs, you've got a web of fabric that, that it expands with the air. That allows my legs to then come up quite flat. So you are flying a bit like Iron Man again. And you're flying really horizontal using the airflow as some of the lift and the rear engine starts to just be pretty much solely propelling you. 
Uh, I mean, we're only scraping the surface. I was quite happy with 85 miles an hour because, again, with that risk thing back on, you know, risk hat back on again, hitting the water, even though I was only 20 feet above the water, hitting in the water at 85 miles an hour is going to be a bad yeah. day out. So yeah. um, that's kind of fast enough for the moment. You could go a lot faster if you were a bit more crazy. But, um, but you know, let's call it 60 miles an hour. That's a very easy cruise speed. That's mm -hmm. a mile a minute in any direction over any terrain. So, um, yeah, you can you can travel some quite reasonable distance with this very quickly. Uh, in terms of lifting people, I think that's, I mean, with the latest suit, it's got a lot of extra lift capacity, but we prefer that to be lifting equipment on you and more fuel. Mm -hmm. It's not really yeah, lifting somebody like a Chinook, you know, dangling. Below. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do, um, I think the way to think of the paramedic work that we've done is a bit like this is a paramedic motorbike, cutting through the traffic, getting the specialist with specialist equipment to your side to manage pain, blood loss, you know, breathing, and then stabilize you then radio back in and say, oh, this is actually not as bad as I thought. Don't worry, slow, slow the ambulance down, cut through the traffic, and then let's just get them back to hospital. Oh my God, this guy's got another half an hour, you know, at most, get the helicopter in. <laughs> that, that first responder paramedic motorbike thing is really critical, and we're like that. We're not okay. gonna take somebody back to hospital. We can just get that specialist with specialist equipment along their, along their side really quickly. So cool. So, you, by my bad, I wanted to ask real quick, how do you actually maneuver this thing? Like. You know, how do you actually control it to move right, left, up, down, stop, go? How does that work? Good question. Um, and it's quite a hard one to answer because if I ask you the same question of how you really steer a bike around, as in a pedal bike, it doesn't really make sense when you start thinking about it. All the sort of, well, I just look where I'm going to go and I sort of, I think I lean, but I'm not sure. Maybe I steer. Actually, when you look at it, I believe I'm right in saying when you actually study how a bicycle works, you actually steer slightly the wrong way when you're at speed and then you lean into it and it's the slightly different, it's the curve of the tire that actually tell, it takes you around the corner. The point is you don't think about it, it all happens intuitively. The weird thing is the same happens with this, but fundamentally what happens is as you increase the power, you squeeze the trigger, the power comes in, you flare your arms out. If you imagine your arms are quite wide and you don't have to do this very much, but that thrust, there's not very much of that thrust pushing down. Most of it's just squishing you in a little bit. So you sit there and nothing really happens. And then gradually as you lower your arms, and all this happens in a fraction of a second when you know what you're doing. When you lower your arms, more and more of that thrust goes down and you start to get lighter and lighter. And a bit like lifting the collective stick in a helicopter, you just rise up. If you want to stop rising up, you just flare your arms back out again and you come down again. Rotation is just, if, you, um, if, you, if your arms are here, if you do that with your arms, guess what? You just kind of rotate. If you want to go sideways, track sideways, if you point one arm out to the side, you'd never do it that much. But if you did that much, you go that way. If you want to go forwards, you just point your arms backwards a bit and you go forwards. All the time, your rear engine is the third leg of the tripod here. But it's actually very much like how a helicopter works, but massively quicker to learn and much more intuitive. I can't really say much more than that. And that's why we encourage people to actually get strapped in and have a go. And they just look up and grin like a child after about three or four goes because their brain just switches on and just like watching a child learn to ride a bike you know in the hole in the back of the saddle and then you let go and they realize that moment of panic size <laughs> and they grin and they like, oh my god i've got it i'm cycling you get that thing and your brain just takes over it's very strange it's just like you said it's practically you're using your body for the whole thing it's just yeah that's that i guess the thrusters and everything so it's 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 so crazy to even think that your body has so much control of what you're doing and flying about what's going on in your brain when you go for a run you know imagine running across an uneven field right how the hell does that work right i mean in real time you're scanning the ground and then your brain gets some feedback to find your foot has hit a, a rut in the ground or a stone and is start trying to throw you off way you don't think about any of this your brain is just ticking over going yeah i'm massively top heavy i'm touching the ground momentarily with one tiny thing that should not work right and compared to how complicated that is what we do is so effortless. I, I, I've hovered for like 30 seconds with my eyes closed before. Do you just relax? You yeah. can literally, when I open my eyes, I've sort of drifted a bit. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's like that easy. It's really, really easy. So, you know, when you think about snowboarding or skiing or rollerblading or water skiing, I'm back to the beginning of the question you asked me about how quickly the brain can repurpose itself to a challenge. You know, skiing or whatever, or, you know, I, I don't know, skateboarding. How the hell should that work? I mean, that's like... <laughs> That's, true. that's like that's like walking but with wheels that are trying to make you fall over the whole time and yet your brain works it out after a while mm. how how did it feel like what emotions were going through your your mind the first time that you nailed it and you were actually hovering off the ground and, and flying with you know both both uh jetpacks 
actually a moment. So um, in the talks um, I do with all the sort of clips and stuff, and it, it's in that original TED talk or the, you know, all the, all the YouTube clips and stuff. There is a moment where a literal defined moment, it was November, 2016. And I, there'd be lots of attempts and I've been in the air for a few seconds and trying to balance all four limbs was pretty hard. And there was a moment where I took off and I kind of got it and I was fighting my legs because when the thrust is on your legs, your legs kind of want to bend. And as soon as you bend your knee, the thrust is coming off the side and it rotates you. It's, it's like I was trying to concentrate so hard to stop my legs bending. Also trying to balance my arms and I just concentrated. And I was in the air and I sort of went forward and I was trying to learn in real time that if I flare out a bit, I come down and then in a bit, I go up and I didn't really want to go up too high. Basically, I managed to execute a six second flight and then landed and spun around. And you see my face in the camera. And I was just like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> In that one frame, that encapsulated all the journey and the idea of the sort of dream I'd had. And, you know, okay, I started the journey in March 2016, but for probably two years before then, I'd filled notebooks with lots of sketches on long haul flights with my work, sketching crazy ideas of what might or might not work, all the time battling this, like, how is this, is this completely crazy? And in that one moment, all of those ideas suddenly like came together as like, oh my God, it actually works. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was pretty cool. So Richard, I want I got to ask you because, you know, obviously it shows you, you've, you're living out your dream. You chased, you pursued it. You're an entrepreneur, innovator. It, it's truly amazing what you have here. What do you suggest and, and, and what are the biggest tools that you used throughout your entrepreneurial career to battle with, you know, I'm sure that there was people letting, telling you, hey, this is not possible. You shouldn't do this. Don't pursue this. You know, how did you, how did you avoid all these, all these distractions? And, and, what, and how did you create that constant drive to be able to go pursue this? Because um, I think a lot of our listeners out there who are entrepreneurs in different fields can definitely get a lot of benefit from that. Say is there is no magic kind of phrase or book or statement or pill you can take to kind of solve this. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of things I can say, which together are hopefully are kind of useful though. So firstly, if you were going to do anything that's special, interesting, different, or breakthrough, there'll be loads of people and loads of facts around you that will tell you it's a waste of time or impossible and not going to happen. But just know that the very fact that's what people think means there could well be a really interesting breakthrough. Um, the very fact that when the iPads kind of came out, a lot of people thought, what the hell's the point in this, right? The very fact that that turned out to be wrong just showed how big the opportunity was under every stone marked pointless waste of time never going to work and probably 19 out of 20 of those stones unfortunately you lift it and go oh shit everybody was right <laughs> <laughs> the 20th the 20th stone though is like everybody was wrong and i'm right and it's a massive opportunity the challenge in life is to work through the first 19 or maybe more you know everybody's familiar with how many um you know prototypes edison for instance, went through, there's loads of stories of this kind of stuff. Every major entrepreneur has been through endless failures. The challenge is how do you call the right moment when massive dogged determination becomes pointless pursuit of something that's never going to work? You've got to like put everything into an idea to the point where you have to take a step back, be your own biggest worst critic and go, I'm still really passionate about the goal here, but this is the wrong direction. I'm going to absolutely cut it off and I'm going to pivot and I'm going to go down this route. That is so hard to do. My background was a trader, right? And the trading ethos is all around taking lots of different risks and knowing when to cut the, you know, cut the, the right ones off. And it's very hard. All you've got to do is ideally have a portfolio of these and be really good at not getting wedded to one idea and just let that drive you into the ground. If I'm really honest, I'll just throw it out there. And it was in the TED talk. I had a very harsh lesson of this when I was 15. My father was a great entrepreneur and innovator. He got stuck down one of those routes. And in the end, he took his own life when I was 15 because that just didn't work out. It was just a disaster in the end. And he just got sucked into it. So I'm a bit of a conflicted personality where I love taking on crazy challenges. And my backdrop probably demonstrates that. But it's taken me 16 years in a corporate job. Okay, I was running a trading book. So it's quite entrepreneurial. But I had to build enough of a kind of solidity of, of financial resources to know that I wasn't banking my family's kind of health, if you like, on this because I know how badly wrong crazy ideas can go. Most of the time, most of these things don't work out. You've just got to keep getting yourself back up again. And in fact, if I just finish it off by saying, the ethos we still apply today is yes, take risk. Risk is how you progress. Risk is getting out of bed in the morning. Innovation is all about risk. Entrepreneurialism is all about risk. The critical thing is that know that that risk will manifest. 
things will go wrong constantly, more often than things will go right. The critical lens is, the critical assessment is, when things go wrong, can you get back up again and fight another day? And I mean that from a financial point of view, a reputation point of view, you know, you piss too many people off, right? And the final one from our point of view, particularly is safety. If I've just broken both my legs, I mean, well done me. I can't really do much more now and worse. I mean, you know, back to look what tragically has happened in Dubai, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, keep taking risks, but keep getting back up again. If you look at it and go, if I take that gamble, I'm gonna run out of money, piss people off, get locked away, maybe the FAA won't like me, um, or I'm gonna do worse and hurt myself or somebody else. Don't take that risk. But if the answer is it's fine and recoverable, crack on. Yeah, Powerful. we always say in the podcast that risk is just an assessment tool, right? It's just a way to kind of look and see whether or not, as you said, right, you need to pivot or if you need to just make a couple adjustments and, and move forward. Yeah. What were, when you were going through, you know, the first prototype or even, you know, the, the design of, of the Jetpack, what were some of the biggest challenges that you came across and, and how did you kind of overcome those? The first one was, I mean, there's a whole succession of them really, but um, the first one was the big leap of going from an idea in a notebook to, am I going to emotionally commit to exploring this? Cause you know, that involved buying some pretty expensive stuff. And just like anybody who's set down a road of training for something big or building a business, you know, there is this moment where you think, Oh, I'm on this road now and I don't want to let myself down. Are you, <laughs> yeah, are you innately that. inventive? Like, do, have you done stuff like this before? Yeah. yeah. I mean, nothing as public as this, but yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm always the person, as soon as, I think I said this earlier, as soon as somebody says something can't be done or something's impossible or somebody hasn't been down there before, or, you know, I'm, I'm that annoying person. I, you know, I found school, I was okay at school. I see this in my eldest son. He's 13 now. And you know, he's annoying like me, right? He's just <laughs> like, well, what about this? You haven't told me about this. What about this? And it's really annoying until you're about 30 and then it all comes good. <laughs> but uh, I haven't told him that because it's pretty depressing if you're 30. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I have. Yes, I have. But I had that big chip on my shoulder about, oh, look what happens if you follow that crazy idea, right? Look how mm. just desperately shit it can turn out. My whole world, family, money, everything just fell apart when I was 15. So I, I was, a, I think in a way, I've taken all those lessons in a healthy way. I've sort of not lost the spirit, but I've guided it down a pathway of trying to risk manage my way down that path. Mm. You know, I think it's a, a scary thing when I hear lots of young people kind of, you know, especially in the current nightmare we've got around the world with COVID, sort of thinking, I know, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a billionaire. I'm just going to throw absolutely everything at the first idea that comes to my mind. And they haven't thought for a moment, just what happens if that doesn't work? They kind of perceive that as, it was weakness or something. No, that's just being sensible, right? Just imagine for a moment, be your own critic. What happens if it doesn't work? Can I, can I pivot? Can I, have I got enough resources and reputation and money, whatever, to have another go at something? Because it might be my 10th idea, my 20th idea. Um, I think that's quite a, you know, important sort of lesson. But yeah, I've always been pretty entrepreneurially minded, I think. No, 100%. I think that, I think a lot of people are going to say that this is probably one of the biggest lessons that they learn from, from, you know, this podcast is, is a fact that you brought up about, the way that you, you know, you took your past as well. You learn from, from what works, what doesn't work. You applied it differently in your life now, but yet you take the risks that you need to take that make sense. Um, and understanding that you do have to take a step back and understand, okay, does, is this going to affect other important areas of my life? And I think that right there, that's another thing that a lot of people jump the gun too fast without assessing before they make that move. And then there's people who just never make the move and then they regret not ever making it. And that's a big risk. Actually, doing nothing is a risk, right? I mean, I, I, I don't want to be unfair on my previous employer, but, uh, um, you know, I came from the oil industry and it won't come as a surprise that the oil industry has watched the climate change movement and, uh, you know, uh, things like that and just kind of sat there and have not done as much as they could have done. And guess what? I think the next evolution in road transport, you know, with Teslas and whatever is going to probably pass them by. It sadly is human nature. They, they got wedded to their own business model and didn't think progressively, didn't challenge themselves. But I think it is really important, especially if I may say, we spent almost more time in the US than we have the UK in before COVID. And the US has got such an amazing can-do spirit of, you know, I mean, the US is founded on this can-do entrepreneurial building something great, you know, the American spirit kind of thing, American dream. I just think it's quite healthy sometimes to add a tiny pinch, only a small pinch of the traditionally miserable British attitude or European attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but, but hang on a minute, everything's probably not going to work. That, and I say minority of that because we're lacking in the UK the, and Europe that spirit of can do and progressive and build our way out of problems. But every now and then, you know, and I'm going to pick on poor old California, 
sometimes the kind of whooping, high-fiving, everything's going to be epic and I'm going to be a billionaire. If only they just stepped back and said, but actually, what could go wrong? What might not work? And how can I cope with that? How am I going to manage around that? And if nothing else, from their own mental health, because I feel like sometimes building yourself up and everybody around you, it's going to be fucking awesome, if I can say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then entrepreneurialism and innovation is mostly about dealing with things that do not work. If I, again, I'll be honest, that I'm really delighted that thing flew today because for the last four days, we've had endless problems, stuff not working, stuff not turning on, stuff just dire problems. But I'm quite used to it. That proves we're doing something difficult, right? But um, I really think that just people having a bit of their own humility and just challenging themselves as to, come on, what can go wrong? And can I keep surviving those downsides? You know, it's like in the military, right? You know, you can, anybody can win a battle and enjoy winning Sorry. that. But actually, it's how do you keep recovering from the setbacks, right? That's mm -hmm. much, much harder. Yeah, and I think that goes across the board, right? And you've kind of touched upon mental health. You talked about, and I'm glad that you really talked about risk management, right? Because especially as an entrepreneur, like risks are un unavoidable. You're going to, you're going to come across problems, but it is really how you handle those situations mentally and, you know, physically with the actions that you take. And I think a lot of times, I mean, we see it all the time in the fitness industry, like people, as we've been talking about, take these big risks, but don't think about the things that could go wrong. And then they don't have a plan when those things do inevitably happen. I think, you know, you read, you read any, any number of business books and they're about amazing people like, you know, Steve Jobs or whatever, you know, and, and I still feel like the message often comes across that to be, to be successful, you just have to be blindly optimistic, you know, super pumped that everything's going to be brilliant. You know, um, what were the Microsoft guys used to run on stage and go high, you know, whooping and whatever, what's his name, Balmer or whatever, you know, mm. that, that, that's great, but you've got to also spend, have that coping mechanism we talked about to deal with all the downsides, all the failures, all the things that don't go wrong. And if you're not prepared for that, I think it's just, it's going to end your journey pretty quickly. Well, I'm going to tell you uh, off the bat, you know, just even uh, me and Josh alone, like I feel like we give each other a dosage of the things that we are, have our strength in and have our weaknesses in. And I, I think, you know, it reminds me of what you're saying because, you know, I can already see the, the type of person I am. Go, 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 go. He's like, all right, so, but let's look back. Let's see what can happen. Let's see with this. And then, you know, we feed off each other and it's just like, all right, now I help, I help him. Let's go, 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 go. Let's get your stuff off the ground. But he'll bring me and he's like, Hey, Anthony, I know you want to do this, but let's break this down and make sure that we can do it the right way. So I think having a team too really helps tremendously when you can have people that can like balance each other out in, especially with certain projects. And that balance is perfect. And if you've got a diverse, this comes into the whole kind of narrative around diversity of teams. The last thing you want is a bunch of people around you who completely agree with you, right? You want, you know, if, if, if you guys had entirely the same personalities, you'd be weaker for it, yeah. right? You want yeah. that adversarial personality thing where you need the super exuberance, probably 105% more. And then you want somebody who's maybe a slightly on the tinge of 5% less positive to be a bit more realistic because you know what? Life is pretty tough. And having that balance and that debate, that's perfect. Yeah, um, that, that makes a great team. And I think a big part of that is being able to accept that critique or that criticism, right? Be able to accept when you do fail or when you aren't up to the standards that everyone expects you to be at, right? And, and that's hard for a lot of people, especially, I mean, obviously, it's a kind of a running joke around the world, but Americans are notorious for, for being, you know, big headed. And, uh, I, and I, I couldn't. Optimistic. I, I just think there's that, I don't know about big headed. I, I think it's just, it comes across maybe to some cultures as big headed, but I just view it as just super can do, you know, glass half full kind of thing, which I'm completely admitting. If you have to have a bias, hell, have the bias of over optimistic, right? Because if you're, if your bias is, is not, you're not even going to try, right? Uh -huh. But it, it is interesting that I think the, the, the missing element that would add value sometimes is just that grounding older school, hang on a minute. Let's just not get too carried away. Uh, but no, I mean, you can't deny there's something magic about the melting pot of American culture where you've got a naturally diverse population of people from all the corners of the globe that built that country, your country, over pra 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 you know, practically the last 200 years where there was I, I, not, not nothing at all and no disrespect to the people who were there before. But, <laughs> but, um, but actually, that is amazing. And you've got an endemic culture of can-do. Israel's the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we do lack that in older cultures. Let's put it that way. Politely. Well, the people that were here before were your people. <laughs> you know, so. Before that. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Them. Yeah, so I, but there was disrespect to them. But no, it, it is an amazing, I think Israel's maybe a, a less, weirdly, a less sensitive example where you've got, you know, displaced 
you know, Jewish people from all over the world, often with nothing left, with nothing to lose, surrounded by countries that historically didn't really enjoy them being there. What an amazing melting pot of can do. What have we got to lose? You know, they would do their risk assessment and go, well, if it goes wrong, it can't be worse than what I've got now because I've got right. nothing. My, my family was killed in Germany in the 1940s. The neighbors might nuke us at any point. Let's just get on and have a go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, I've, I've been to Israel. It's pretty interesting, though, seeing like, you know, these 18, 19 year old kids walking around with AR 15s everywhere. I'm like, all right, well, I, at least I feel safe. <laughs> you know, like, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But, but, but hopefully they, they, hopefully they can use them well. <laughs> <laughs> that's another element to it. I, again, you know, uh, I'm probably trampling all over all sorts of political you know, sensitivities here, but who cares? Um, <laughs> but actually, the national service element of the Israeli culture is really powerful because there's a bunch mm -hmm. of young folks, most of whom don't enjoy doing their national service. They're sitting in a military bunker somewhere or a trench or doing service on a patrol. And you know what they do? They all talk about the business they're going to go and set up when they're out. Mm -hmm. How cool is that, right? I mean, it is, a, it is a perfectly engineered culture. And I think there's an amazing statistic that number, two, number one in terms of the world patent filing culture is America. Number two is Israel. I didn't three know million, wow. There's three million people in Israel. I think it's three or seven, I, even if it's seven. I mean, there's 70 million in the UK. I mean, then 350 or whatever in the US. Look at it per capita. It is an insane culture in Israel. All right, so we got an get, example. We, we got to get an Israeli with your suit and let's see what he does. Let's see. <laughs> get someone in the Mossad. I should qualify this. You know, I'm bigging up Israel here. It's the, it's the cultural melting pot mm. with the right ingredients to drive entrepreneurialism, which I think has really interesting value uh, lessons for all of us. Yeah, I, lo I loved it there. I thought it was great. I haven't yeah. been. I definitely got to check it out. Yeah. How, uh, you know, what's other than the new, the new prototype that, you've been kind of mentioning, but are teasing us with and can't show us. Uh, <laughs> where do you see the business kind of going from here? Are you going to focus more on, you know, teaching people how to use them and, and helping with the military and helping with, with search and rescue? Or are you going to, are you planning on expanding into other products, other, other maybe aviation or non-aviation products? So uh, I think I said at the beginning, I had no real plan. I just thought it would be a cool thing to build. I got a phone call to go and do TED after we launched it in 2017. Um, found myself on a plane going to Vancouver to do the very first demo outside of the, frankly, the farmyard where we developed it to do a TED talk and then a flight of this thing in front of the world's media. So to kind of hedge that risk, I um, accepted an invitation from um, a bunch of called, folks called the Drapers in San Francisco um, who wanted a demo in their VC kind of parking lot and their VC open down. I thought, you know what, I'll just go and test it there and check it works before I go to Vancouver. Um, turned out that Tim and Adam Draper are two of the most famous kind of VC family dynasty folks in the U S and, um, they wrote me a $640,000 deal on the parking lot after I did the demo. Wow. So it turned That's out great. Quite That's handy. a great demo. <laughs> that was good. That was really good. That was the very first demo I ever did. Then I did Ted, it worked. And, um, Adam Savage was actually my ground crew there accidentally. Um, Having done that, it went around the world, went crazy, and then we just got the phone ringing off the hook with requests to do, do demos around the world. So we did the, the 105 events. We were earning like $100,000 for two-day events in like wow. Japan or China or the US. And we sort of sat back and thought, this, this wasn't really planned, but how else can we compete with earning that kind of money whilst we're also getting really good content, amazing social <laughs> media, mm -hmm. and we're on the national news of 31 different countries? We're getting paid to market this thing. Yeah. We don't, and, and we don't even know. That's the best. That's the best kind of marketing when you get paid. Right. So, yeah. right. so, so we sort of thought, well, let's just roll with this. Um, accidentally, it gave us an opportunity to test the equipment in all these different geographies all over the world, which is quite cool. And it's pretty stressful turning up somewhere and, you know, within minutes to often having to do events and stuff and live TV. But anyway, um, that then started to make us think, well, actually people are losing their mind over this. So why don't we roll this into a race series? If you think of like Red Bull Air Race, over, you know, over water around pylons. That was the plan. We were going to launch that in March in Bermuda, um, but COVID obviously kind of paused that. It's still the plan to do the race series. But in the meantime, because we've been in the media so much and because we've had so many interesting people reach out to us, it led to paramedic stuff and military things. Mm. It led to lots of people saying, can we come and buy one or train to do it? And so it's actually been quite interesting to sort of take a step back and note that from an engineering point of view, we clearly just are not afraid to go and try crazy things as long as we can recover from the downside. So actually it's worth kind of sharing with you guys that from a commercial point of view, we've accidentally ended up taking the same strategy. If in doubt, look at the request that comes in, 
Is it kind of embarrassing, dangerous, or too crazy? Well, no, let's go and try it. <laughs> so a, a negative example is air shows. We did several air shows and got paid really good money for it. But we learned in the meantime, there is a huge encouragement to go very high and very dangerous. And also there's actually very little money. Maybe in the US it's better with Oshkosh and things, but mm. in most air shows, they are, they are populated by militaries who charge nothing because it's an advert. And old guys, mostly, um, some women, but mostly old guys who are wealthy, who've got a nice shiny Mustang or Spitfire, don't charge anything either. So we're suddenly in a world where there's no money and you're supposed to do it just for the love of the, you know, the display, which is lovely, but doesn't pay any of the bills. Right. So that was an example of a learning we never would have got unless we tried it. And we didn't cost us anything because we got paid for the ones we did do by other sponsors. Uh, but on the other hand, the paramedic thing, you know, you mentioned it earlier, that was literally the air ambulance here pestering us for about nine months to come and play we went up there for two days and one night if you see the youtube it's kind of worth it i may say the last few minutes of the youtube is really funny where we did a whole load of behind the scenes stuff which is pretty mad and there's an amazing interview if you even just wind it forward the last 15 seconds of the film there's something that almost makes you kind of well up with the feedback from the paramedic guy who'd been so passionate about this for nine months when he finally saw it fly um he's just he was literally nearly in tears about it um, they were so passionate about what we could do. We turned up with no idea of really what we could deliver. And then the headline was, I took off out the back of their paramedic vehicle, pretending to be the paramedic to go to a pretend casualty. I got to that casualty in 90 seconds over rough terrain wow. and over rocks Unreal. and whatever. It took 25 minutes to walk. So the response time was insane. And they so just all lost their minds. Huge. Right. So, and we just had no idea. So we applied the same kind of exploratory, what's the worst that can happen? We'll fly low, we'll keep it safe. Um, and look what we learned. So we remain kind of wonderfully open to stuff that's coming coming along. There are some amazing things that have been thrown at us that it turns out we can do. We never had any idea. And again, to people running their own businesses, maybe listening to this, you know, be as open-minded as you can. Don't close off anything unless like, it doesn't fails one of those risk rules. Um, I mean, here, here's a really mad idea, right? So I won't mention the company involved, but do you remember the, the crazy dam break that was in Latin America? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. where, when it flooded the horrible tailings dam yeah. that's flooded, drowned a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just put it this way. It turns out, having done the analysis from the people who reached out to us, it turns out we can help in the remediation of over 30 of those. Wow, that's, um, that's, that's phenomenal. That's, that's, a, that's great from just the, uh, the sketches you had in your book, you know, a couple of years ago, man. That's incredible. It's completely mad. They are using operators on long ropes from helicopters hovering for up to five hours at a time to keep those guys safe in case the dams break. And we've proven that we can, uh, I mean, on paper anyway, so far right. with the technical capability we've got. And if it wasn't for COVID, we would have gone out there and proven it so far. They've got 10 years of work to kind of work through. And I mean, it turns out we can do that. That's a great example of something I never would have imagined in a million years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got a, a really nice portfolio of, of work going on. And even back down to just doing stuff, we even get paid by some social media platforms to do educational stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so actually in the time of crazy COVID disruption, having a big portfolio of activity, another good lesson for other entrepreneurs, having the most diverse portfolio possible means that yes, we've lost all the events we used to do, Actually, we've been busier than ever doing other stuff. That's incredible. Um, we're almost to the hour mark. And, you know, I, I want to say, I know Anthony's yeah. itching to ask you a few rapid fire questions uh, at the end here. But, you know, I want to say it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, you know, getting to talk to you, getting to learn, you know, a little bit about your history and the history of, of your business. It's, it's remarkable, as you mentioned, to really see what human ingenuity can, can bring about if we, if we work hard enough and, and are resilient enough. So, you know, thank you for coming on here and, and, you know, sharing your story a little bit with us. Where can people find you? Uh, and what's the best way to reach out to you? It's been my pleasure. Um, so uh, Instagram, if you look for take on gravity, as in you're fighting it, take on gravity. Um, and then on YouTube, I mean, there's lots of very cool films on YouTube, if I may say. Uh, if you look for Gravity Industries on YouTube, I mean, we're on TikTok and Facebook and all the others, but to be honest, Instagram and um, YouTube are the main ones I would recommend. Awesome. Awesome. Once again, I want to say thank you. And, and really, it's been a pleasure to have you on here and share, you know, your dream. So I'm going to hit you with uh, some of these rapid fire questions and uh, we'll get it going. All right. Number one, um, if you did have a price point on that product, what would that price point be? thousand US dollars is what we have sold it for. 240 no, 440. 440. 440. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm sure it's going to keep going higher with the new product. The new one for the same price, actually. And actually, yeah, okay. 
anyway, anyway, it's supposed to be rapid fire. We, <laughs> we, by the way, we got to start doing more podcasts so that we can, we can practice these and we yes. can start racing it's, when he starts doing the races. That's my next cheap, goal. Much cheaper to come and learn to do it. If you look for gravity.co, not .com, just to gravity.co, there's an inquiry form there. Come and sign up. Even, even though COVID means we can't come out to LA quite yet. Put yourself on the waiting list and come and fly, or you guys come out. Okay, I want to. I want to get skilled enough to race. That's. I, that goal. is mind blowingly fun. Yeah. I tell you, yeah. that's awesome. Have your. I know you mentioned you have a, a family. Did you have your? Has your son ever tried this? Yeah, Instagram and TikTok. You can see my thirteen-year-old actually having a go, and he's pretty good. That's awesome. Awesome. All right. Next question. What is the vision for this twenty to thirty years from now? where we'll be in five years time but if nothing else uh let's go even call it five years i will be satisfied with just inspiring young people to dare to ask what if love that and then i want to ask you what is the craziest wildest experience you ever had with one of these a brand new three billion pound aircraft carrier with my royal marines berry on scaring the crap out of dod generals and Air Force leader. That's epic. That is epic. epic. <laughs> those guys, <laughs> those guys don't, they don't sweat at all. So, no, yeah. but no one had told them I was coming on the ferry vessel thing. <laughs> you can see, all that on, you can see yes. that on social media. Oh, man. That's, epic. That's awesome. <laughs> Last question What's the biggest piece of advice you can leave off to all our listeners today? But just manage the downside. Awesome. Love that. Awesome. Thank you again, Richard. We it, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on here. And you know, if you're ever in Miami, we'll we'll get you in here and we'll get you in the studio. Maybe you'll bring one of the, the new suits with you. <laughs> I ran some of the water you've got there. That'd be very cool. Plenty of it. <laughs> All yeah. right, Richard. Thank you so nice much. Nice to talk to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, until next time, guys.